and welcome to Risen's Home Worship. My name is Martin and I serve as the pastor here and I'm thrilled that you are tuning in. As we worship, let us look to Jesus and be reminded of his goodness and grace. And as we begin our service, we're going to consider a passage out of Colossians chapter 1 that encourages us to see Christ for who he is, the holy and righteous King of Kings. And here's what it says. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead. So that in everything, he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Church, God calls upon us and speaks to us today. Let's worship. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. And so how sweet the sound, oh how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is good news for the captive. There's good news for the shamed. There is good news for the one who walks away. The one religion filled for the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound! Oh, how grace abounds! We will praise the Lord our rescuer. For the weary, his rest for those who strive. Oh, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. Yeah, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life.
tree Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy And all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us all Oh, how he loves us How he loves us Risen family, this is the time of our service that we typically call family time. It's traditionally called Pass the Peace. And while this may seem sort of just like a tradition that we do, um, or just something to like fill part of the service, it's so meaningful if you take the time to think about it. This is the one space in our lives where we can remember that the thing that matters the most is that we have peace with God. And because He's created peace with us because of Jesus Christ's work, we can now share that peace with others. So this is the, the time of our service where we say what matters most to us, 
not our political ideologies or where we stand socially or economically, but where we stand is on the peace of Christ. And that's what matters most to us. So go ahead and share that peace with someone else right now. Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 3. There is a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, I know we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are not old? Demas asked. Surely they cannot enter time into their mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should know not to be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born the spirit. This is God's word. Good morning, Risen family. Uh, my name is John Darrow. I'm part of the teaching team here at Risen Church. Um, and this week we're going to continue on in our study through the Gospel of John. Uh, last week we looked at chapter 2 and uh, Jesus' um, uh, miracle of turning the water into wine. And this week we're going to transition into chapter 3 um, and the famous conversation between Jesus and one of the leading Pharisees of, um, of all of Israel. His name was Nicodemus. And, and look at how that conversation um, really is what I'm titling this message, uh, Reimagining the Kingdom, in that how Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus provides a unique and different framework for how we not only understand the nature of God and what God is doing in the world, but also what that means for us and how we are to perceive God and interact in the world. Um, this passage is very popular for it contains arguably one of the most famous Bible passages of it ever, uh, John 3.16. Um, but we're going to look at that in a little bit, and we're going to look at that in the kind of greater context of what John is trying to communicate in this chapter. Um, but it is important for us to take a step back and briefly um, remember what happened back in chapter 2. Um, Jesus does this incredible miracle where he turns water into wine, sort of symbolizing this, this new imagination, this new idea of how God is entering into the world and making things new. And then he continues that in the um, overturning the tables in the temple. And when he does all of that, the religious leaders within Jerusalem are, are, are noticeably angry, but they're also curious. What is going on? What is this guy doing um, that he's overturning the tables, that he's driving out the animals, that he's, he's throwing the money on the ground. He's kind of cursing the practices that were occurring within the temple. And one of the things that stands out is that as they're challenging him or, or asking him what authority he has to do this, Jesus' response in verse 19 of chapter 2 is very striking. He says, destroy this temple, referring to his own body, and I will raise it up in three days. So you already have a glimpse that every single time the religious leaders 
the, the religious authorities or even the, the larger crowds, whenever they're pressing Jesus on something, his response is not what they're expecting. And often it's driven back to himself as a representative of God's kingdom and how God is moving in the world. And so as we transition into chapter 3 um, and this conversation with Nicodemus, we, we get the same idea and the same picture. But this time, things are a little bit different. It says in the first part of chapter 3 that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night um, when it's dark outside. So there's nobody around, there's nobody awake, there's none of the other religious leaders that are there to kind of interrogate him. Although it does say that Nicodemus came, uh, he says he actually uses the first person plural pronoun, we. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. So presumably there's other um, uh, religious leaders with Jesus. But he comes and he asks him in verse, uh, in verse 2 of chapter 3, he says, Rabbi, or teacher, we know that you are a teacher that has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now it seems striking for a second here that you have this religious leader who is supposed to be opposed to Jesus, is now coming to Jesus and sort of affirming him, right? That's what we see on the surface. But I think if we read a little bit deeper into Nicodemus's questioning, something struck him in Jesus's activity that he is actually more or less interrogating him a little bit further to define who he is and what he's doing. So rather than just simply giving over some sort of flattering statement, Nicodemus is actually asking a series of questions to Jesus. He's saying, who are you then, right? Who are you really? We know you're a teacher from God, but are you more than that? Are you a prophet? Are you the promised Messiah? These are very, very important questions that Nicodemus wants to make sure that he's interpreting Jesus' intentions correctly, but he's also in challenging Jesus who are you? Who do you say you are and what are you coming to do? But again, just like we saw back in chapter 2, Jesus ditches the statement or the original questions and instead he gets it to the core of the issue at hand. And while Nicodemus had claimed to have seen the miracles that validate some sort of connections um, with Jesus to God, Jesus' response suggests, well, Nicodemus really didn't see anything. Because Jesus' response in verse 3 is, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Think about that for a second. You're asking somebody who's just done this magnificent, cataclysmic miracle event, right? And turning water into wine. And now this, this same person goes into Jerusalem on the Passover, the highest religious ceremony of Israel at the time and even today, and he destroys the temple. He makes it causes this big old scene, this big old ruckus, right? And you're challenging that man, who are you? By what authority do you do these things? Are you a prophet? Are you the Messiah? Why are you doing what you're doing? And the first response from this person is, I tell you that unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. For me, if I were to hear that, I would think that is the biggest non-answer I've ever heard, right? You're not, you're not addressing my question. Don't ignore the question, right? I asked you a specific question and why are you, why are you changing the subject? But what Jesus is doing as God's representative on earth is he's actually answering the question much more explicitly than Nicodemus has any understanding about. Because what Jesus came to do was to bring the kingdom of God, was to manifest the kingdom of God on earth right here, right now. And clearly what Nicodemus is seeing or what he thinks he sees, he's not seeing. And Jesus is bringing that, that out for Nicodemus in this passage. And so in response to a question about who Jesus is, Jesus is actually responding by explaining who and what he represents. It's not simply about who I am as a person that Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying, it's about what I came to do, how I came to represent God and his kingdom here and now. And the rest of the chapter really is building off of that statement. And so the central focus of this chapter, and I would even say to a large extent the entire book, is to determine the nature of the kingdom and how it relates to what John calls eternal life. 
Um, while there are nuances and distinctions between eternal life and the kingdom of God, they are largely communicating the same idea. The first three books of the New Testament, what we would call the Synoptic Gospels, the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are communicating things such as the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Um, These are communicating, again, ideas of God's presence in heaven and on earth. John uses the language of eternal life a lot more. And this is a a rhetorical device. It's a thematic idea that that John is using to communicate exactly what God is doing um, in the presence of Israel right here and now. And so what what John is doing through the communication of Jesus with Nicodemus is he's communicating the same idea. Eternal life consists of God's kingdom. But going back again to verse 3, when Jesus challenges Nicodemus's idea of what Jesus did, he says that unless you are born again, you will not be able to see the kingdom of God. I think that is a very profound statement. And if we're not careful, I think we'll overlook it. What Nicodemus wanted to know with his implied questions about what Jesus did as a potential Messiah was coming to establish God's final kingdom rule on earth. This was a very radical, socio-political, militaristic uh, event that Israel was longing for God to do. He was going to come and establish his physical kingdom here on earth, and and they were going to dominate and and conquer over all the other kingdoms that had mistreated them and oppressed them over the years. And so in this particular moment, we're looking at Uh, the empire of Rome. And that's what Nicodemus was looking into. But what Jesus was saying was that in order to see the kingdom, it requires a different set of lenses, a different set of eyes. And in order to do that, it's to be born again into a, a different way of looking at the world. To be born again is to occur through the life of the Spirit, through the ministry of God's Spirit entering into this physical space. But Jesus' aim, again, is to steer the conversation in a completely different direction. All throughout this chapter, um, we we see things that Jesus states such as, as we testify to what we have seen, or he'll say things like the earthly things and the heavenly things. He's drawing uh, Nicodemus' attention to things much broader and much wider than this physical space, this limited physical space, and he's also challenging Nicodemus's perceptions of what it means for God to reign and rule here and now. He's asking the question, ultimately, you say that you see these things, but you don't really see these things. And as a religious elite, Nicodemus should have been well aware of those things. We have to remember that as a Pharisee, as one of Israel's leaders, he would have memorized large parts, if not the entire, what would they call the Pentateuch, or the first five books of our Old Testament. He would have been studied and versed and well aware of everything that the law would have intended uh, for God's people. And more than that, he would have been well versed and studied in the traditions of the prophets uh, of, of Israel throughout their past. So for Nicodemus to miss these things... Jesus is saying, you're a leader of, the, of Israel, you're, you're a religious leader, and you don't understand these things? You're not seeing them. He, he, notice what he's saying, though. He's, he's not saying you just missed it. He's saying you're not seeing it, right? To see what God is doing re- requires an active participation on our part. And so what Jesus is saying, ultimately, is that there is a distinction and a difference between kingdom observation and kingdom participation, All of Israel was living and existing within a kingdom observation, right? They lived underneath the sphere of God's God's sovereign rule. They knew that God was present and with them even in the midst of their suffering. And they were looking for that, that final cataclysmic cosmic event that, that God was going to establish his final rule. But what they missed was their actual participation in God's rule, in God's kingdom. And this is why Jesus came, was Jesus came as an invitation for his people to follow him into this radical new kingdom idea. We are to to not just live in the kingdom, but we are to see and participate in it as well. But what's noticeable about all of this is if we were paying close attention to the story, we too are the Nicodemuses of the story. 
a lot of us have grown up in the church. A lot of us have grown up within religious experiences where we, we think we understand and know what it means to be a part of God's kingdom, but we're not seeing. We're not paying attention to how God is leading us to participate in His mission in the world today. We're longing for that day that God would establish His reign and His kingdom finally, ultimately on earth. But what we're missing is that He's inviting us actually to participate in it here and now. There's this, this idea of the kingdom of God or eternal life being the already and the not yet. If we follow Jesus, we are already entering into eternal life. But at the same time, because God's reign and rule has not been finally and fully established, there's the not yet aspect of the kingdom. Those of us who claim to follow Jesus have to live in that tension of the already and not yet. God is establishing His presence as Nicodemus was hoping for. However, it just doesn't look the way that we want it to. The great idea that Jesus is trying to get across in this chapter is that what we think about the kingdom of God and eternal life matters. It matters greatly. It determines how we understand who God is and what He is doing amongst His people and in the world today. Many of us have been taught that the idea of being born again or entering into eternal life is really just one quick get out of earth free card where we go live in heaven with God for, for all of eternity. While there certainly is a large component existing in that, what we're missing is what eternal life consists of here and now. Eternal life is not simply passive. It's not simply letting the world go by while we live in some sort of expectation for the unknown or for the afterlife. Jesus cares about human beings much more than that. He cares about the church here and now and wants to see the church flourish. He wants to see his people flourish. He wants to see the world flourish. And he's calling and summoning those just like Nicodemus who are well versed in the Hebrew scriptures, who know the religious traditions really well. He's calling those people to pay closer attention to what they think they know, but they haven't been seeing all along. And so too is tr true of the church today. Many of us, again, have grown up in religious traditions where we're not quite seeing what God is doing right here and now. We're living in the past or we're living in a way that we thought we have understood or perceived what God was doing. And when God isn't working the way that we want Him to, we get frustrated or we get upset or we challenge God that maybe God isn't who He says that He is. I would encourage us to look at this text a little bit differently, to scale back and see how seeing the kingdom of God, being born again allows us to see eternal life and then what that looks like for our participation. One of the passages that is the most famous in all of the New Testament, as I said earlier, is John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And one of the things that we often hear when we hear that passage is this idea of belief. And when we think of belief, we think of cognitive, we think of, of, of rationality and thinking and understanding and knowing in our heart that God is real and that God sent His Son, Jesus. Well, certainly uh, an understanding of the gospel requires that sort of cognitive um, engagement, but that is not what the word group that we often translate as belief only means. The idea of belief or trust also implies obedience and allegiance. If we actually believe that God sent His Son to earth to redeem all of mankind, then it requires that we submit all of ourselves to that person, the person of Jesus, and obey and commit, submit massive allegiance to Him and His purposes in the world. Because again, eternal life is not merely waiting for the future, it's living in the here and now, today. Yes. We have to believe that Jesus is God's Son, but we also have to enter into what he, God's Son would have us as the church do to, to commit to that idea of allegiance today. The full display of God's allegiance and what allegiance requires in order to follow Jesus, I think is actually found in verse 19 and 21 of this passage. And I want to read that for us. Jesus says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. And people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. 
But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is a jam-packed uh, couple of verses that really requires its own uh, message because of, of all the things that it's communicating. But there are a few things that I think stand out to us that I hope we would pay attention to. First off is he begins this, the very first verse here in, chap, in verse 19. This is the verdict or this is the judgment. This is the conclusion. Light has come into the world through the person of Jesus, but people in general love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. This is important when we think about the aspect of faith. Oftentimes there's this false dichotomy between believing in something and then doing something. And I don't think the New Testament gives us the, the ability to separate those things. I think believing and committing to something requires that our deeds and our actions are, are compatible with the belief. And, he, and Jesus affirms it in this passage, right? If we're committed to the light, well, as he says later on, it will be plainly seen to all people, right? You, people will see our deeds. Again, this idea of seeing something. They will see our deeds because they're also seeing and experiencing the kingdom of God. And those who will do evil, well, those evil deeds will also be exposed. And so he shows and explains, displays this contrast between light and darkness being the display of our actions. What we do notice in this is that there is no middle ground. You cannot have light, darkness, and then some sort of gray area. You are either of the light following Jesus or you are of the darkness following after your evil desires. But as those who are participating in God's kingdom, those who call Jesus Lord, we have a distinct and uh, I would say very unique mission as it pertains to seeing the kingdom of God. See, one of the unique attributes of the, of the light is to reveal to the darkness that it's in the darkness, right? There's a contrast. So one of the aspects of us as the church is to display to the world that it is the world, that it is living in the darkness. But it's not just to let the world stay in the darkness, but to show them that, look how beautiful the light is. It's to, it is to create that distinction, that dichotomy, not so that it would live in evil and wickedness, detached to its own vices, but that it would be an attractive sense in, in driving the darkness back into the light. That is what we have been given over to do. And so as we think through this a little bit more, um, I can't help but, but think of what does that mean for our current situation as a church living in America? What does it look like for the church to be the light in a world or in a nation that's living in darkness? Now, certainly not everything in our nation is dark. Certainly there's a lot of beautiful, wonderful things that we as Americans um, hold to be true, that we, we value, um, that, we, that we absolutely love. But if we're being honest and we're looking back over the course of just the last few weeks and the, the climax, the conclusion to four years um, under a political administration that has sown so much division. Um, as we think back of, of through that division and how it culminated at the Capitol steps a couple weeks ago, and if we think about those things in light of the celebration we just had last week of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, we look back and we, we try to make sense of all of the things happening in our world right now. And a lot of us want to retreat. But again, the light doesn't retreat. The light engages. It steps into the moment to remind the world, to remind darkness that it is dark. But the light is to provide hope that there is something better than the darkness. And so again, as we think back in light of, of, of what has been happening in our world, rather than retreating, I actually think that this moment, this political moment that's happening in our country, is a great and unique opportunity for the church to engage as the light. I think we need to step into this moment and remind the world that there is actually hope. There is actually hope for all of this division. There's actually hope for all of the, of the divisiveness and the the ugliness and the darkness that's occurring in our world right now. It doesn't mean we disengage from the conversations or, or political activity, 
But rather than clinging to one side of the political divide, it's revealing Jesus as the ultimate political figure. If he is, is submitting to the church to display the goodness of the gospel to the rest of the nation, we have to be asking a deep series of questions. How then do we engage in that activity in light of our world? What is our voice? What is our activities? What is the, the optics that we are presenting to the world in light of our current situation? And again, in light of our recently celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I think of the prophetic voice that he offered to our country over 50 years ago. The, the, the country was living in the darkness of deep racial divide and segregation. And he was providing a third way that both sides absolutely hated. He was presenting the way of nonviolent resistance. He was doing marches. He was doing sit-ins. He was doing boycotts as a way to say, we are resisting the powers. We are resisting the darkness, but we're doing it by displaying a beauty, by displaying the light. And of course, most people didn't like that because he was challenging the status quo, but he was also ang making people angry who wanted to do more violent uh, actions, more militants. That was the way forward. He was cutting a third, third divide down the middle. And when I think about what he provided to our country back then, um, if we think back 50 years ago, he was a very hated man. In fact, in his final book, Where Do We Go From Here?, he actually started to critique much more than what was happening in the civil rights movement. He began to, to critique the economy. He was critiquing the Vietnam War. Um, he wanted to see equal rights for, uh, for sanitation workers. He wanted to see migrant workers get, have greater value. He was, he was doing some bold things. He was breaking out of the civil rights movement and looking towards the future. And many of America hated him because he challenged every single angle and corner. And now 50 years later, Martin Luther King Jr. is one of the most revered men in the history of our country, as he should be. But we can't forget the prophetic voice that he provided to our country uh, 50 years ago. I think back to that book, Where Do We Go From Here? And he, in, in, he writes in this, in this book about the church and how the church is to step into the cultural moment. So at that time, he says, the church has an opportunity and a duty to lift up its voice like a trumpet and declare unto people the immorality of segregation. It must affirm that every human life is a reflection of divinity and that every act of injustice mars and defaces the image of God in man. But declarations against segregation, however sincere, are not enough. The church must take the lead in social reform. It must move into the arena of life and do battle for the sanctity of religious commitments. And it must lead men along the path of true integration, something the law cannot do. While our country has moved past deep segregation, it is no mystery that we are still living in the deep uh, racial divide in this country, political divide. Um, economic divide. These things that plagued the country 50 years ago still exist. They've just manifested themselves in different ways. But one of the things that, uh, that Martin Luther King Jr. said at the end of that quote was that the church is to enter into something that the law cannot do. As a church, as a distinct political entity living in this country, we recognize the law, we recognize the government, but we also realize that there's, there's only so much the government's gonna be able to do. If the church is to be the light of Christ that is, as it has called to be, it still has to realize that the government is not that light. It is not that church. The church is that light. And so we are to step into those areas of darkness and ask those questions of how we serve our brothers and sisters who are experiencing deep racial divide? How do we help our brothers and sisters who are living in the midst of deep economic crisis? How do we help our, and serve our brothers and sisters who live on the other side of the border but can't come over because they have a different national citizenship? Right? We are asking a series of questions and beginning to pray through and understand how would God have us move in this moment? The answer we have to be prepared for might be different than it might have been answered 20, 30, 40, or even 50 years ago. Is that God's move is happening in a unique way for our time. 
That's what it means to see the kingdom of God. That's what it means to enter into eternal life and to see the light and expose the darkness. To take Martin Luther King's words as a prophetic invitation and opportunity to see God working in our world than we've never seen before. I think in particular, this passage is a call to us, who, those of us who have been following Jesus for a long period of time, but are stuck in the way that we think we know how God is going to move. We don't. The Spirit communicates to us how He is going to move. Studying the scriptures and studying the text in light of what's happening in our world, doing this together as a community, this is how we begin to discern where God is moving and how He's leading the church accordingly. As we enter into the rest of the Gospel of John as a church, as we enter into this cultural moment and we see the, the political divide that happened over the last four years, it's not coming to an end. It's only going to continue to manifest, and it's going to manifest in different ways. And the church is to remain steadfast as a distinct political option that does not subscribe to the right or to the left, red or blue, donkey or elephant. It rides distinctly in the middle as a prophetic witness of Jesus' eternal life and the kingdom of God. And so us as Risen Church, I invite us to participate in that, to engage in that, and to be vigilant for what God would do through our church and in our community this year. Well, let's end our time with this blessing and you can reach out your hand like this as a way to receive this blessing as I proclaim it over you. So, Risen Church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.